I think uh, in 10 years we'll reasonably be in uh, seven figures, million dollar Bitcoin. We're gonna actually see a reversal, I would predict. Uh, you'll see first in the US a reversal of nuclear power policy. We'll start building nuclear power plants again and I would then guess probably in Germany at some point yeah. they'll come to their senses and do the same thing. Yeah, hope so. And, and the reason they'll do it is not because of humanitarian saying it's cheap energy and it's better. They'll do it because Microsoft and Apple will tell them to do it. In this recent interview on Bitcoin Magazine with Michael Saylor, we explore Bitcoin's current position, political ideas about its future, and energy centralization issues. Bitcoin is trading around $63,000 down 1% in 24 hours, but up 2% over the week. Saylor emphasizes that Bitcoin is not just a currency, it's a revolution in how we think about money. He distinguishes between money as economic energy and currency as a method of moving that energy, noting that fiat currencies dissipate energy over time. Saylor believes that Bitcoin could become a $250 trillion ecosystem without threatening any nation state by demonetizing various assets. Before we dive in, please like, subscribe, and share this channel. Now, let's hear from Michael Saylor. Now, I think Bitcoin is technology and it's digital capital. And I think there's a transformation of capital from analog to digital. And I think that, that uh, every company, every government, every investor, every technologist will look at that and people will embrace it at whatever rate they want to embrace it. Like, let's take the internet, for example. Did the internet change politics in the last 30 years? I mean, if you look at the development of the European Union, what was the role of the internet? <laughs> or if you look at the development in China and Russia and the crises, and what was the role of the internet? Uh, if you look at everything that happened in South America in the last 30 years, what was the role of the internet? I mean, the internet spread everywhere. It's gone everywhere on earth. It's changed everything, but you still have economic conflict, political conflict, military conflict. You have evolution in society and, and uh, the internet just keeps spreading. So I think Bitcoin's going to spread like digital capital. I don't think you need any cataclysmic event for it to spread. I think it's just a better idea. Like uh, it would spread regardless of whether there was a conflict and, you know, con conflict, chaos, hyperinflation will accelerate the spread. But, you know, if Apple computer builds the Bitcoin into the iPhone, it's going to spread because Apple built Bitcoin into the iPhone. And why will they build in the iPhone? Because they'll make hundreds of billions of dollars if they build in the iPhone. Why wouldn't they want to make billions of dollars? billions of dollars. So people will do it because they can do it. And uh, countries will adopt it at whatever rate and investors will adopt it at whatever rate they will. It's just a better idea. It's digital capital, just like digital information. This is digital capital. It's going to permeate society. What I'd say is Bitcoin, it doesn't solve all the problems in the world. It just solves half. It's the half where you need economic power or wealth to do anything, right? Who wants power? Everybody wants power. Who doesn't want power? Right? What are you going to do with the power? Well, everybody has a difference of opinion on what they're going to do with it, but I think everybody can agree they would like more economic power, not less economic power. And uh, the world seems very simple to me. It's like there's $900 trillion of wealth measured in dollars. The dollar will continue to expand 7 to 10% a year. That means in seven to 10 years, there'll be twice as much of that. If, if Bitcoin you know, goes by a, a factor of 10 or a factor of 15, so it'll go from 1.3 trillion to 20 trillion, it could be 1% of the wealth of the world and be a million dollars a coin and the world will be whatever it's doing. Right, so I'm I'm not really uh, I don't I'm not of the opinion that there needs to be some catastrophe or there'll be some major, yep. you know, world event order mm -hmm. change. I think that this is just good technology. It's going to spread just like mobile phones mm -hmm. spread. As we just heard Michael Saylor discuss Bitcoin's current position, now let's hear him elaborate on the energy dynamics surrounding Bitcoin. 
Saylor emphasizes that Bitcoin is not just a currency, it's a revolution in how we think about money and energy. He explains that Bitcoin can be viewed as digital energy, with the ability to store and transfer economic value efficiently. Saylor points out that while Bitcoin mining is often criticized for energy consumption, it's actually driving innovation in sustainable energy production. He notes that major tech companies like Microsoft and Apple are currently buying up large amounts of energy, similar to Bitcoin miners, but for different purposes. Saylor argues that, Bitcoin is the cleanest, most efficient use of energy in the world, as it incentivizes the development of renewable energy sources and utilizes excess energy that would otherwise be wasted. Now let's listen to what Michael Saylor has to say on Bitcoin Magazine. Yeah, I would say the principle of paradigm shift is people only yeah. adopt a new paradigm in war or in death. Yeah. So you either have to, you know, all the old guard has to die, right? Uh, teenagers and 20-somethings, they're at the beginning of their life, right? What do you want? You want fame, you want fortune, you want respect, you want a family, you want a girlfriend, right? Yeah. You have none of those things. <laughs> you have no assets. True. <laughs> Therefore, you have nothing to lose, everything to gain, and someone presents you with the idea of YouTube or a mobile phone or Bitcoin, or electric guitar, right? Whatever it is, and you embrace it, right? The new, uh, the new paradigm. When you're 75 years old, you've already had the family. The respect. You've already got the respect. The you've yeah. you've the already fame. got the money. You're, like, you don't need to prove anything. Maybe you've already messed up your life. <laughs> maybe, maybe you haven't, but the point really is you have the most to lose, the least amount of time, the lowest amount of neuroplasticity, the least to gain, you're the most resistant to new ideas. Yeah. So, so youth will adopt a new idea. Yeah. Seniors will reject a new idea. Uh, the exception of that is in a war when you reject air power and then the enemy drops bombs on your city and blows up your headquarters and you look up, then you realize that your thesis was incorrect. Mm. You know, if you have cavalry and they have tanks, you know, then you realize the thesis was incorrect, right? So, um, so in wartime, when you have, when you have massive trauma, like people all think they're going to fight the next war with the weapons from the last war and, when the next war comes along and there's 87,000 robot drone swarming wasp things to come through your window, you'll realize that all the stuff you had from 1990 that you were going to fight with is useless. Yeah. Right. So that'll be a paradigm shift. And I think that uh, COVID, COVID was like the paradigm Definitely. shift. That, but it doesn't catalyze everybody because a lot of people didn't lose everything in COVID. Only some people lost everything yeah. in COVID. Uh, uh, uh. Some people gained. Yeah. Right? And uh, so, so that, that's a catalyst. Chaos will continue to be a catalyst. But there's a tipping point, right, with these things. There's a point when something flips from being out of consensus, right, strange, terrifying, to being absolutely normal, to them being essential. And I think if you look in the history of technology, look at the photos of New York City in you know, 1905 versus 1915. And somehow people went from horses on the streets and carriage to automobiles. Yeah. You know, and there was a state change and everybody was against it before they were for it. Yeah. And there's a lot of things like that in the history of technology, you know, whether it's electricity or whether it's automobiles or whether it's mobile phones where it's just you know people are against and then all of a sudden they just flip and it happens in a hurry when it happens yeah i think that the world is changing at a more rapid rate i think the next 10 years are <clears throat> are a very rapid transformation along at least two dimensions that i'm familiar with there yeah. may be more than two that i am not familiar with but the two i'm familiar with would be digital money and digital intelligence yeah and it's pretty clear that that um there's hundreds of trillions of dollars of capital which is analog money and as people start to transform the analog to the digital 
you're going to see profound disruptions in business models and, uh, and uh, financial applications and financial institutions and you know, a lot of things people took for granted for the last 30 years, they'll just throw out the window and yeah. say, what? Well, you, if I run a survey on Twitter right now and I ask you how many of you are going to you know, invest in Bitcoin versus equities versus gold versus something else, I think like 3% of the people say equity. <laughs> if you roll the clock back 20 years, it's like, well, well mm -hmm. like 3%, right? So there are certain things where people just don't think that way anymore. Um, yeah, it's a transition. And I mode. think with intelligence, yeah. you know, the, the AIs didn't work until they started working. And I guess they started working last year. And we're either in year, maybe we're year two or year one or year two. I think we're year one of adoption of digital money. And I think maybe we're year two of adoption of digital intelligence. And I think they're going to spread like wildfire. Mm. And if you had to trace catalytic events, I would say the catalytic event for digital intelligence was the success of chat GPT of course, yeah. 4 yeah. when it went from zero to 100 million users mm. you know, like this, like yeah. in a month or something. Mm. What? Yeah. And that was after 40 years of trying mm -hmm. and 40 years of garbage. <laughs> Like, like people use Siri or Alexa to pick their playlist, <laughs> yeah. you know, pick out a song. Yeah. Right? That's the only app yeah. people can come up with. And then all of a sudden this thing is composing, you know, perfect, you know, Shakespearean poetry or, you know, whatever it is. And it's like not bad. So I think that that, that kind of caused people to wake up and that caused Microsoft to wake up and of course the capital markets react with Nvidia stock and Microsoft and the like and and uh, you know the hyperscalers are going to build 60 gigawatts of data centers a year and they want 600 gigawatts like that's like all the electricity in the world like Crazy. it's so powerful right that digital intelligence move is so powerful that it has flipped all of the big tech companies to buy up all the electricity in Europe and the US, but it's also caused them to flip and become pro-nuclear power. To watch the full interview, check out the link in the description. Michael Saylor provides a compelling analysis of Bitcoin as digital energy and its impact on the global energy landscape. He emphasizes that Bitcoin is the cleanest, most efficient use of energy in the world and explains how it's driving innovation in sustainable energy production. We would love to hear your thoughts on some questions. How do you think Bitcoin's energy consumption will shape the future of renewable energy development? And what role do you believe Bitcoin could play in optimizing global energy distribution and usage? Thank you for tuning into only the savvy if you enjoyed this discussion please subscribe like and share our video for more engaging content diving into the innovative world of decentralized technologies